This is Off to Off Topic, a show where two men with the attention spans of a squirrel try and fail to stay on topic with the day's subject. Where will their oral meanderings take us? Well, stick around and listen, because today's Off to Off Topic topic is... Today we will be talking about bouncer, bodyguard, actor, and rapper Mr. T. He's a subject I picked because he is one of the most iconic stars to us Gen Xers, a man who appeared in nearly every form of media available in the 1980s. Nate, how much do you know about Mr. T? Anything you want to go over before we talk about him today? Uh, Basically, I know him from, of course, A-Team. And I know him from Rocky, what was that? that It's Rocky 3. 3, Rocky 3. And then, of course... I always, the first thing I think about Mr. T, which is totally stupid, I think about that cartoon he was in and the, and the serial. Uh, yep. We're actually going to touch out, on those too. Okay. Like outside of that, like just, you know, Mr. T as a yep. cultural face. Yep. That's what he was. He was just basically the face of the 80s for us. And we will actually get into both the serial and that cartoon because uh, they have some interesting facts behind them. Yay. Yay, indeed. All right, let's get back into Mr. T. Birth name, Lawrence Tarot. He was born in the projects on the south side of Chicago, May 21st, 1952, and was the youngest son in a family of 12, with four sisters and seven brothers. Jeez. Right? (laughs) Not having any money to speak of, they lived in a three-room apartment and often slept three to a bed due to the cramped living conditions they had. Now, when Lawrence was five, his father said, see ya, and headed out for the proverbial pack of smokes and never came back or made any further contact with him. This left more bed space, but also left his mother to raise all 12 kids by herself with a paltry $87 a month welfare check. That's just messed up. I mean, both wealth, welfare check and him just taking off like that. Yeah. But I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where I was going with that. Well, yeah, you just, could be the nice. bright side. I mean, he might have been a raging alcoholic who went on to beat every person he uh, encountered the rest of his life. So eh. maybe oh, he left people. Mr. T could, could have been or. Oh, no. Mr. T's bad. dad. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's always like, well, he could have been a murderer. So, yeah, well, he could have been because, I mean, Mr. T's dad never shows up and he's never talked about by Mr. T after this. So even after he be- made it big, the guy never connected the dots yep. like, oh, hey, you know, that. Nope, never came back in. And I don't even know his dad's name. Like, well, could, I mean, Mr. T like... literally never talks about him outside of the fact he just took a hike when he was five. Yeah, it could have been like Coco. You guys remember that movie Coco? I uh, never saw the movie Coco. Explain. Uh, Oh, just it, the same thing where like the husband left for his for music and was never seen again, and so they the the continuing generations hated music because you know music is stolen away. But come to find out, the dude was murdered, and he was so yeah. I'm just basically a long way of saying he could be dead because again, yeah. like, I assume so purely based on the fact that he didn't. You know, I'm assuming a piece of shit like that would not pass up their opportunity to try to take advantage of a son. You know, that that's where my, my assumptions come in. Something bad must have happened to him. Now he was still a piece of shit. I'm not saying, Oh, what if he does actually legitimately what a smoke's going to kill? I'm not saying that. I think he was a piece of shit. who took off. I'll just say like, it surprises me that that, that same uh, guy would, I've I realized I'm saying piece of shit a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> that same guy would just like, Oh, look, that guy I left a long time ago is now super rich and famous. I, I'm, I'm not going to get mine. I have too much pride to try to you know, lower myself after abandoning my family. It's funny to bring this up because there might actually be a pretty decent reason uh, he never got in t- touch with Mr. T again. And it might have been because of something Mr. T did. We'll go into that in just a few, actually. Uh-oh. I'm glad you brought this up. Yes. <laughs> so he's, that, are you, that, that's a, that carries the implication of uh, Mr. T's got blood in his hands. Uh, actually, there is a uh, quote by him somewhere along the way that's kind of along those lines, but it uh, has nothing to do with his father. Okay. Yep. So, $87 a month welfare check to raise 12 people. That's, um, yeah, that's not much money going around. Probably a lot of, uh, you know, cheese sandwiches and other pancakes for breakfast and this and that. Really cheap food. You know how that kind of stuff goes. Totally. Okay, his mother's dedication and working herself to the bone for her family did not go unnoticed by Lawrence, who did odd jobs as a child to help out, washing windows and doing chores for the neighbors, and basically doing as much as he could, bringing in some extra money here and there to help out. Because seeing his mom work herself ragged for the family, Lawrence, as a young man, made a promise to himself. Soon as he made it big and got some money, she was going to live on Easy Street, and he was going to make sure of it. He was going to buy her everything she needed, and basically be like, "Hey, mom, you took care of me. Now is my time to take care of you." And this was a promise that you know a lot of people in this position, I'm sure, made. But young Lawrence, he would actually achieve this goal, unlike many of these people. Boy, howdy! 
<clears throat> Excuse me. Boy, howdy. Boy, yeah, boy howdy, howdy. He did. Boy, howdy, he did. He had always been very close to his mother. He called her every day on the phone, even when he it was in his most famous days, all the way through his life, called her every day, talked about her every chance he could in interviews for movies. Doesn't matter the movie or the cartoon or the show, whatever he's doing, he would always try to drop his mom how much he loved her, a little blurb. And even in his WWE Hall of Fame acceptance speech, he br brought up his mom and how much he loved her and how big of an influence it was. And he's totally unashamed of uh, his love for his mother. And he's quoted as saying he's absolutely a mama's boy, but he's not a wimp. Can't really argue that uh, topic. So I was laughing at the very end of Coitus. He's just like, stands up. He's like, ah, oh, like my mother. It wasn't just a tagline. He was really into his mom. It's it sounds weird when I say it that way. Yeah, it sounds like it was <laughs> yeah. <cool. laughs> uh, and and as like, a side note, this is probably smart <laughs> of uh, Mr. T. As much as he talked about her, never brought up her name because I cannot find her name anywhere or anything about her other than just you know she was Mr. T's mom. It's kind of sus. Like, yeah. Oh yeah, I, I was I had a mom, not you know a tube in a science <laughs> lab. I'm not a plant here from planets, you know. Ooh. Okay, corona. back in the uh, back in the day, Mr. T actually escaped from a lab where there's just an entire like uh, warehouse just full of tubes filled with various Mr. T's of right. various sizes. We got giant T, mini T, middle T, and here's Mr. T. That would be actually kind of cool. Have just a whole army of Mr. T's wandering around. I don't know what you'd do with them, but hmm. yeah, what would you do with them? I mean, <sighs> to what end? Yeah, I mean, you could have an interesting choir, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could hunt fools. Yeah, yeah, but... you could uh, have a lot of pity for fools. Indeed, big old fool pity party. Also, because of his mother, he grew up very devout Christian and stayed that way his entire life. Uh, his entire life, he's done a lot of charity work for churches, and he also credits religion to keeping him away from drugs and alcohol his whole life as well. Which, as far as I can tell, um, I don't think he really was ever into drugs or alcohol. I saw a couple of pictures of him holding like a booze bottle in his hand, but it was more like he was posing for pictures at a bar and whatnot. So, hmm. Maybe he does actually have a sober life. I mean, yeah, sure, why not? I mean, yeah. I definitely know he turned to a preacher at some point. Yep. Pretty much all he does nowadays, too, is just do preaching and uh, charity work for churches. While his mother was incredibly supportive and loving of him and his siblings, outside of uh, the family home, uh, not much positivity growing up. He remembers him and his family always being talked down to and disrespected, being told the usual things you can imagine the poors of the ghettos hearing. You're never going to amount to anything. You're poor because you deserve it. You're all just lazy. You know, the usual things. We're kind of just talking about that in the uh, pre-show talk a little bit. Indeed. In the poor ghettos. Though of all the insults, one thing really stuck in his craw and he hated it more than the others. He really, really disliked being called boy, as was the insult of the time. Remember when, uh, you know, was typically a stereotype was southern white dude, boy, you don't oh, know yeah. what you're talking about, boy. Come over here, boy. Let me learn you, boy. I automatically yeah. flashed to my high school where I, I told this guy about, about this guy before. He was, uh, was a civ teacher and he looked like Foghorn Leghorn and even spoke mm -hmm. like him. And yep. he just, I straight up was like, I say, I say, boy, like, dude, really? Do you have to be just like him? Huh? He's like, boy, you got to understand me. I don't sound like Foghorn Leghorn. Foghorn Leghorn sounds like me. <laughs> I imagine that's how the whole uh, exchange would go there. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, there are people that legitimately talk like that. I'm Foghorn Leghorn was based off of somebody. Yeah, it wasn't born out of yeah, you know, vacuum. Them Kentucky Colonels and the such. But, Good old Kentucky Colonels. Yep. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which, uh, as I've said before, my uh, mother-in-law actually ran into the colonel before he died. She said he was a dick. Yeah, um, I've heard uh, shows and read interviews and stuff. He was not a good man. He no, tried he to kill was... somebody with a shotgun at one point over a uh, rival chicken place sign or something like that. Oh, wow. That... And he... um, and then, of course, his wife had his restaurant, who I actually live, I, I live very close to. Um, it's just within a mile, out, it's within a mile of the city border. Uh, the city I live in. So it's like right there. I can get there in like 15 minutes. Um, Claudia Sanders. And I'd gone there before and it was, it was pretty nice. It was like this wooden, large wooden house. And you go in, it was, it was set up very much like a, uh, almost kind of like a bed and breakfast sort of thing. Yeah. With, uh, it, almost like a Cracker Barrel, but not quite, okay. you know, maybe a little bit lower rent at Cracker Barrel, but it's still nice. And then, Happened to burn down. I'm doing a, a look of uh, Mr. <laughs> evil. Uh, yeah. Dr. Evil, sorry. He didn't go to seven years of evil medical school to be called Mr. Um, huh. But uh, 
yeah, he it mysteriously burned down. And it, like a, there was a just universal raised eyebrow, like uh, <laughs> burned oh, down. Sure. Huh? Just especially happened since, to burn down, especially <laughs> since like what they built in its place. Uh, yeah, your eyebrows <laughs> are a little bit higher up. They, <laughs> did, they did not replace it to how it just happened to look. They right. made mass improvements to that place. <laughs> <laughs> It it doesn't look anything like it did yeah. originally. So it's yeah, one of those things too, where the fire t- the fire starts at like three a.m. on a day they're not even open, so nobody's been yeah. in the restaurant forever. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is definitely one of those. The, so where some hobos eating really well for a few nights yeah. after the uh, fire he started. Like I have no proof, but look, allegedly <laughs> this is how it went down. Yeah, yeah, I have zero proof, but just, hey, hobo, you want a big old bucket it. of fried chicken? All I gotta ask you to do is go uh, set fire to this place. It was kind of a, it was almost a greed universal. I was kind of looking at each other. It's like the silent nod, like, okay. We're, <laughs> we know what local happened. news we're, is kind of like giving you that nod, like, eh, wait for the new restaurant right. to open. It'll be nicer. <laughs> we have it on good authority. I, I went there once. It was fine. You know, I don't know. I don't expect. It. Yeah, I, we. Yeah. So I've, I went I've there kind of learned over the years. Fried chicken can only get so good usually till it's just you know kind of fried chicken. But it, it, you know, at that point, it's a restaurant. You know, because it having the thing about having homemade fried chicken, if you know what you're doing, it's like it's unique. And like every every time you do it, it tastes generally similar. But there's little different variances, yeah, right? But at a restaurant, they did lovingly put that thing. They got a. They got. A, truckload of chicken and they fried it all and they threw it out there with you yep, know, some very barely literate person is like reading a sheep being like dump chicken and fryer and push button two but this guy he used to go into fried chickens i'm sure you've heard the story too he used to go into kentucky fried chicken and like jump the counter and go back there and tell them how they were doing it wrong because <laughs> well because they you know it's once he sold the name he, uh, oh, cont- uh, the colonel was doing this. The colonel was doing it. Okay. Yeah, I thought you were talking about some just random dude being no, like, no, no, no. I the know colonel, Like, while you're still alive, the colonel still did this. Because what he did was he sold the franchise, <coughs> but they're like, your recipe's too expensive. Like, we, we would, we'd be losing money if we just kept on making chicken with these. Gilded uh, saffron <laughs> that you want. Yeah. Kind of stuff. And so they're like, we're going to do, what, you know, what's closest, but we're going to do what's cheapest. And so he he very loudly said that Kentucky Fried Chicken's chicken was awful, and they, to the point where they sued him to shut him up. And he they basically because they're like he's talking, he's the colonel. We need to stop him. And the judge is like, but he's the colonel. Like you you can't you, you can't make it's a free country. You can't make him shut up. Yeah, right. As long as he's not you know advertising himself as still the spokesman, really. I mean, right. people are still going to assume he's the spokesman, but he can't go around being like, I'm talking on behalf of. Yeah, so, yeah, it, I mean, this is all old stuff. I mean, obviously, the dude's been dead for a while. Okay, young Lawrence really disliked being called boy, and people did it a lot to him. No matter how he acted, no matter how responsible or immature he acted, people just kept calling him boy. He would always try to make himself a little bit better, get cut down with another boy comment. You get how these things happen. Mm-hmm. But Lawrence did have a pretty unique idea of how to combat this, though. He had an idea. He determined that if he changed his first name to Mr., then that's what they'd have to call him from now on. No one could call him boy anymore because his name was Mr. Change people like, hey, what's your name? Mr. Mr. T. Then, I mean, yeah, you can't really call him anything else other than Mr. from then on, really, unless you want to be a total dick and start a fight. Okay. So, well, for I mean, his eighth, he was a big enough guy. Like, I don't know who'd want to start a fight with that guy. Yeah. Uh, he didn't actually start bulking up a whole <coughs> lot until uh, late teens, actually. Because for his 18th birthday, Lawrence got the gift of a new attitude. He started talking the talk, walking the walk, building muscles and gaining wit and legally changed his name to Mr. T. First name Mr., last name T. Once he became Mr. T, he quickly scrubbed Lawrence Tarot from existence. Uh, Almost immediately, his driver's license, bank accounts, mailing address, and everything said Mr. T on it legally. If the world was going to give him respect, he was going to take it by... It's just Mr. T himself into respect. And this might actually go into why his dad could never find him. Because, I mean, if your kid doesn't look anything like he did when you left him when he was five, and all of a sudden there's just some dude, Mr. T, going around. Hmm. Well, isn't that always true? Like, you you don't look the same. Yeah, sure, you have similar characteristics, but I don't know. Maybe but also, I mean, that. well, I mean, okay, if all of a sudden, 30 year, 25 years later, you're looking around and be like, hey, that dude kind of looks like my kid, but his name's Mr. T. Weird. Yeah, true. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you're really motivated and just assume that 
everybody you see on TV that kind of looks like your kid might be your kid. You want to go researching it, but do you really think Deadbeat Dads is just sitting? Well, maybe he is actually. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just sitting at home, just scribbling down all the names of uh, African American actors under. Hey, maybe the kid that said Dino Might is my kid, and I can get some money out of him. <laughs> What's his real name? Yeah, <laughs> uh, the Dino Might kid. <laughs> What was his name? Uh, you know, I'm never. You know what? I'm not gonna look. You know, it uh, this is one of those names fine. that if I'm were not thinking about it, it would literally just pop into my head just randomly because he is one of those guys who is super bitter about his fame and uh, the fact he was based off of a catchphrase. Yeah, I mean that would. That's the thing. It's like everyone wants their 15 minutes, and that guy. I mean, he had more than 15 minutes. And of course, everyone wants money, but like when you're known for that one thing, I would just, definitely get sick of it. Yeah. I think it might also have to do with how early or young you get famous in life. Because, like, if all of a sudden I was known for a catchphrase at 18, I might get kind of pissy because I'm like, well, I don't want to get shoehorned into this. At the age of 43, I might be like, screw it. I'll give them what they want. Wubba lubba yeah. dub dub oh, yeah. over and over and over again until I die. Give me money. <laughs> yeah, because I believe uh, the Dynamite kid, his whole thing was he didn't want to be like a serious actor. He was like, hey, I could go do Broadways and movies and this and that if I could just get out of this uh, Dynamite kid. Was it? It sound like you said like, it sounded like you said you didn't want to. He no, he did to want do. to. Yeah. Or at least that's what I was led to believe. I mean, it's possible. I mean, look, I mean, um look at the guy from um, Cranston. You know, he went from Malcolm the Middle, who is a total like nut job or you know, crazy funny dad, and then he went to Breaking Bad. Yeah. So what did he do before all that? Just kind of bit parts, didn't he? Before uh Yeah, he Malcolm did in the Seinfeld. Middle. He did, gotcha. he did a, the, a really popular role in Seinfeld. He was just like a one-off, but he was like the dentist. Yeah, um, and I'm sure yeah. he was in other little bit things here and there. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, and actually, it's funny how he heard that story because the Seinfeld bit, apparently, whoever the Seinfeld show, whatever, whoever was in the Seinfeld show, and he did that. One of the people, like the showrunners, one of the main people, but like someone who had grown up, he's one of the lead guys from Breaking Bad, and because he worked with them at one time. That's how he got the Breaking Bad role. Not not the Malcolm Middle. It was between there. Like once the Malcolm Middle ended, they were looking for a guy for Breaking Bad, and then they reached out to him based on a role that he did before Malcolm. Yeah. Middle. So anyway, yes, it's yeah. called a happy coincidence. Or it is happy like, coincidence. Of yep. course, it's always it's all who you know. Once this again, is I, very true, especially in Hollywood. It feels like. Yeah, I mean, once again, I'm gonna say out loud: Where's my nepotism? Yeah. <laughs> About a year after adopting the Mr. T moniker, he had his first child with his high school girlfriend. So Mr. T did what any good father would do and went out hunting for a career to support them. Well, he was a pretty strong and athletic guy, so he first tried out for the Green Bay Packers football team. Apparently, he was a pretty good, talent, a pretty talented football player, but he blew out his knee, and that was the end of that. <laughs> that would suck. Can I try out? Sure. Blam! Well, never mind. Sorry. Yep, pretty much. And they're like, hey, you kind of got some talent. You're doing all right. Show up for some more practices. Oh, and now you got a limp for the rest of your life, probably. I don't know if he has a limp, but eh. Probably when it rains. Right. Well, now he's older, Mike. I mean, he's probably, I think he was all good during those uh, 18 days, but those, eight, those 18 days was a while ago. Yep, yep. Next up, he got a job with the city of Chicago working to gym for underprivileged kids. He loved this job, and it also laid the foundation for his future love of kids and charity as well. But sadly, it didn't last more than a few years as funding dried up and the gym closed down in the mid-70s. He decided to try to use his physicality again for his next job as he enlisted into a basic training with the Army and was assigned military police training. Now, this job didn't tickle his fancy as he moved on pretty quick, but not before one interesting side note I read, and uh, one that I think plays into our story just a little bit later. The year is 1976, and while on training exercise in Fort McCoy, Wisconsin, he committed a minor infraction, and his platoon sergeant decided to teach him a lesson by ordering him to cut down trees with an axe. Just a couple of later, hours later, Mr. T had felled about 70 trees with that axe and was ordered to stop because they were running out of trees for him to cut down as punishment. Hmm. I bring this up because he has another incident with trees in the future. Yeah, maybe he's got a thing against trees. He goes back he for a hates long, long trees. Time. He might. He might very well. Again, we'll touch on this later. He was uh, inappropriately touched by an ant. <laughs> Father Ant, what are you doing? Come here, child. No. Come to me in the rectory. <laughs> Come in my rectory. Yeah. <laughs> <Over and over laughs> <again. laughs> yeah. Whoever came up with the term rectory way back in the day needs to be like teleported to the future and be like, look what they've done to your word. <laughs> Deciding the uptight and clinical nature of the military wasn't his style. 
who went the other direction and started working as a bouncer at the famous Chicago nightclub Dingbats. And here's where it all starts for the man. He cranks up the look and the attitude to an 11, and this is also where he begins his famous gold chain necklace. Remember that giant gold chain necklace he wore? Oh, yeah. I mean, that was kind of yeah. his thing. It's kind of his iconic thing, giant... yep. Well, that and his mohawk. Mohawk, yep. And we're about to get into the uh, origin story of those. So the ne- the giant necklace basically started out as a lost and found for the club. Drunk or forgetful patrons would lose their jewelry, and Mr. T would collect the items and wear them while he was working the door from then on out. If someone returned and noticed their missing jewelry, T was more than happy to give it back to him. Be like, oh, yeah, you left this behind, man. Do better next time. However, some of the jewelry was taken as battle memento- battled mementos during his skirmishes as a bouncer. And in this case, he would actually keep wearing that jewelry as a challenge to the former owner. Want your jewelry back? Well, come and try to take it from me. Yeah, no one ever tried to take their jewelry back, apparently, as the story goes. It just, he just kept the jewelry and it helped build his image and notoriety as the necklace got bigger and bigger. And while, okay, in, if this is medieval, talk, medieval, like, okay, you know, fight for honor or whatever, but like, this is still a place by laws. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure even though he was a drunk asshole, guys asked me, he can't be like, Oh, your honor, you know, um, I know he wants his very expensive necklace bat, but we, he lost it in combat. So it's mine now. Eh, do you really want to go to all the trouble of going to court and admitting you got your ass beat in front of God in the world for over a $100 necklace? I mean, it depends on the situation. You go home, you're like, your wife's like, where's that necklace? I was going to give it, it was my grandfather's necklace and he, you know, died. He smuggled it home in his butt. <laughs> it's not, we need it back. Well, I'm going to say if you're at a nightclub called Dingbats from Chicago and you come home missing your jewelry and your wife talks back to you, you probably just hit her, Nate. <laughs> I mean, we're not talking about this. The fucking Ritz Carlton. There's a club called Dingbats in the south yeah. side of Chicago. I guess you're right. In fact, we're going to go into what kind of stuff happened at Dingbats here. Because how tough of a bouncer was Mr. T? Well, the former owner of Dingbats, Ron Biz- Brisman, remembers multiple times people would point a gun straight at Mr. T's face. Mr. T wouldn't even flinch. With a serious tone, he'd just say, you don't want to do this. And those intimidation checks worked every time. Never got shot. And then way up the F around and find out scale, a former manager of Dingbats also tells a story where he personally was stabbed during a scuffle. Mr. T, not like seeing his manager stabbed, picked up the stabber and body slammed him right on top of a fire hydrant, shattering his ribs and ending the fight right then and there. I can imagine getting up from that. I mean, the fire hydrant is exactly, like, breakable. And if he hit just on a spine, it's like, oh, no, yeah, I didn't kill him, but he'll never walk again. Yep. Well, don't go around stabbing people. <laughs> don't go around stabbing Mr. T's boss, I guess, is the actual name of the story there. Is it the more you know? The rainbow coming yep. up? Yep. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, we need an animation of uh, <laughs> Mr. T just picking up some of your body slamming and all of a sudden that little it, star comes over the top. The more you know. Yep, Mr. T pointing out, more you know, fool. So fuck with Mr. T. Yep. But can't you imagine that just getting picked up and dropped on or body slammed onto a fire hydrant? Oh, that'd be awful. Yeah, that, yeah. Nothing good comes from that. Yep. By his and others' recollection, as Jobby got into about 200 fights, being it's a South Chicago nightclub named Dingbats, I can kind of believe that number. City got sued a lot, but never lost a lawsuit over it. People tend to notice that sort of badassery and thus began his next gig, Professional Bodyguard. His client list was set to said to include Steve McQueen, Michael Jackson, Diana Ross, Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, and Leon Spinks. The last three being boxers. I was going to say, I'm just going to pretend like I know the last few. Yeah, uh, Muhammad Ali, boxer, Joe Frazier, boxer, Leon Spinks, boxer. Leon Spinks was actually the big one that kind of got him into the limelight. Because I believe it was a Madison Square Garden show with, you know, 80,000 people or something like that that he attended. And everybody's like, ooh, look at that guy. But you best believe in Muhammad Ali's the boxer. That's like, he's huge on here. He's from Louisville, so. Is he? Oh, yeah. He's from Louisville, so, dude. Do most people he, call him Cassius Clay down there? <laughs> no, they call him Muhammad Ali. They, they have a whole, like, uh, museum dedicated to him. And, like, you drove downtown, there's, like, a, a, a side of one of the buildings that's him painted on it. And it's, yeah, he's a big deal over here. Still. I mean, I think he's dead, too. I saw him once from a distance. He, like, came to the movie theater once. But that was like when he was, he wasn't Muhammad Ali anymore. He was Muhammad Ali, but he wasn't, you know, he wasn't talking about butterflies and stinging. He was, he was more shaky like, Jones. Yeah, he was more like, oh, where am I? What's my, <laughs> <who are you? laughs> where am I? I used to be a big, strong man. 
Uh, he, yeah, I thought he got punched the head a lot. I mean, yeah, he was a great. I mean, don't get me wrong, Muhammad Ali, yeah, Muhammad Ali, but you get punched that many times, it's it it does it does something to you. Yeah, yeah, one would think that. I mean, repeated brain damage. Around this time, working as a bodyguard, is reported he is making three to ten thousand dollars a day, depending on the client. He was all about commanding respect and honing his image. At this point, at first, he didn't have a signature mohawk. He actually had his hair in the shape of a T as a bouncer. When people would ask his name, he would just bend over at the waist to show them the big T on his head and be like, T, Mr. T. <laughs> Which sounds kind of corny in a way, but whatever worked for him. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> T, Mr. T is like, okay, you fucking. Yeah. Uh, All right. <laughs> James Bond, like, you like your thing shaking, not stirred. Or... Yep. And they got to make sure your head's like perfectly shaved all the time. Other people are going to be like, you're Mr. Fuzzhead? Yeah. Fuzzy T? Yeah, Fuzzy T. <laughs> Then one day, he saw a man, Deacon Warrior, sporting a mohawk in a National Geographic and said to his friends, By golly, that's a look for me, my good chaps. That's exactly how he said it, Nate. Trust me. I'm sure he... That yep. was exactly By golly, he, he put down his monocle and said, Will you come over here and look at this? By crom. This, this shall be my new look. Fetch me my spats. I'm going to the barber. Why, Senor T. <laughs> At this point, he even adopted the slogan, Mr. T is the best bodyguard to have, next to God. Remember, he's religious, so can't be above God. But here's the thing. Like, let me submit this to you. Um, I would think my cat would be a better bodyguard than God. I mean, look at, I don't know, the world. The <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's oh, oh, look, he died. Well, how'd he die? Well, his bodyguard was God. Well, well, there you go. Well, that just means God had a bigger plan for him. One yeah, his best- cannot possibly <laughs> fathom. Great. <laughs> it's too bad he, uh, you know, that nerve gas was released and everyone's dead. Oh, fortunately, uh, he was he was walk around and just uh, well, container his pocket full of this virus. He just depended on God <laughs> to, to help prevent anything happening. Uh. Mr. T's next big break would come in 1980 when NBC came to Chicago to film America's Toughest Bouncer. The events included throwing around a 150-pound stuntman, breaking through doors, weightlifting, and of course, the dwarf toss. I mean, how low of ideas. They're like, okay, what are we gonna do? Uh, I don't know, world's strongest bouncer. Okay, sure, that right? sounds great. And this is like part of their wide world of sports things, but I mean how could they be tapped out with ideas right now? There's only three networks back then. They had plenty of ideas to go around. I mean, dude, your your competition's like two other people. Just don't suck. That's all yeah. you gotta do. Or or suck less than the next guy. Yeah, man. That's kind of all competitions, though. You don't have to be the best. You just have to be the least suckiest. I suppose. I don't know. But even that's not true, because I've seen some pretty... I mean, we've both seen some pretty sucky stuff take off like crazy. Uh, this yeah, is like true. Qual- quality television just like canceled after several episodes. Meanwhile, you've got, I don't know, I'm blanking on a name. The uh, bloody splish is- splash show. Right. Or Love is Blind. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, what was that other one? Milf Island I heard about. Oh, my God. <laughs> I saw that. I saw a trailer for that. I showed Jenny. She's just like, oh, my God, I'm not watching that. Because she definitely watched Love is Blind. She was all about some Love is Blind. Because, I mean... And I saw some of it too, and they're just the worst. I mean, it is yeah, they're just always the worst. Yeah, is it just a bunch of just like generic people and whatnot? Or no, they're not. I mean, they're, they're all a lot of them are just bad people. Gotcha. And, and plus, they're like, oh, here, they're the girls are always totally made up, and you can if you look at them, you can kind of see behind the makeup, and they're not as pretty as they're presenting themselves. Oh yeah, no, and and their name's just, probably not really saffron either. <laughs> And I mean, they go in this room. The idea is, you know, they each go in the room and they talk to each other for a while and they get to know each other. Uh, oh, beneath the skin, they know their real selves, but it's like two weeks, maybe. And so then they're like, okay, you'll get married. That's like, I don't know, six weeks. What could go wrong? Yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, it it is all just ridiculous. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, it's people looking for their 15 minutes of fame. It's exactly what it is. And if you're not I mean, talented, you might as well just use the fact you're single and get married. Yeah, I'm not saying any, I am by no means breaking, like, oh my God, you know, he's speaking the truth. Let's follow him. I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm not saying anything. A thousand other people haven't said, but still, it really is. But I'm going to say this. I'm going to say all that and then follow it with, it's entertaining. You know, I'll, 
Like I'll be, I don't necessarily watch it. I'm not going to turn it on and watch it for myself. However, if I'm in the room and Jenny's watching it, then I'll, I'll keep, I'll kind of poke at it and see what's up. Yeah. Speaking of poking at things and seeing what's up, all finalists of the uh, toughest bouncer would meet in a boxing match to determine the winner. Like and- no holds barred, um, you know, WWF style where there's, you know, punching at the same time or what? No, an actual, like, real, like, legitimate boxing match and actual, hey, we're going to go forth and fisticuffs at noon. Okay, so one-on-one with a tiered system going yep, down. Yep, like exactly. Okay. In, a pre, in a boxing pre-match interview, Mr. T to the camera said, I just feel sorry for the guy I have to box. I just feel real sorry for him. He went on to win the event. But most importantly, a certain Sylvester Stallone, who just happened to be looking for the antagonist for Rocky Three, was watching this. And he loved Mr. T's look, and he loved that interview that he gave. The interview where he said, I just feel sorry for the guy who I have to box. I just feel real sorry for him. That uh, line did, is actually with Stallone. Did he pity the fool? Hmm? Did he pity the fool? Does uh, he pity the fool yet? Did he say the thing? This is- in fact, that line I just said, that is what Stallone based the Rocky Three line, I don't hate him, but I pity the fool off of. Mr. T uh, did not write that line. Stallone did, and he based that off of a uh, Mr. T interview from that uh, – toughest bouncer bit show so yes you were correct nate this is where it uh, came up with i pity the fool i'm the not fool correct, line is, he did not put he did not come up with this so that's just alone came up with it correct well there is a little bit of some debate some people are kind of iffy but literally sylvester stallone has the only screenwriting uh credit for the movie and that's where the uh, line came from was that movie so it's pretty, most people believe that it is a combination of Mr. T doing that one interview and Stallone just twisting that around to sound better for them. And again, the full line is not just, I pity the fool. It's, I don't hate him, but I pity the fool. Now, Mr. T did actually eventually trademark this line, I pity the fool, in 2015 because it was so iconically tied to him. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I cannot blame him either on that. May as well. I mean... If anybody else uses that line, they kind of just look stupid, or you're immediately going to think Mr. T, so you might as well lock it in. Yeah, I that can't think be- of anybody who'd be like, who would t- try to argue, like, no, you know, Sylvester Sloan should get the credit for that. Yeah, right. So, Also, Mr. T kind of has his own idea of what that phrase means, I pity the fool. You see, most people, when they see it, a lot they think of it as an insult. Mr. T's calling somebody an idiot, and he just feels bad for them being an idiot or a fool. But Mr. T, he personally, his spin on it, he associates it with a biblical version of pity, which means mm-hmm. showing mercy or forgiveness. And in his mind, it's that line is more of him being like, hey, man, I know you're a fool, but I forgive you in this situation. Boo. It's, <laughs> I know it's it's more of a loving phrase in his mind than a condemnation phrase. Of, I mean, I again, but it's this also thing, goes back to him being very religious and, you know, not wanting to be a bad role model kind of thing. Uh, again. I guess it's not my, you know, it's his phrase. If he can't, you know, I can, who am I to dictate what he considers to that say to me? You know, oh, you're whatever. Nathan Townsend. Boom all you want. You just did. <laughs> I, yeah, I did. Boo. <laughs> boo. boo. I, I stand by that booing. However, it doesn't mean anything to him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, <laughs> so where uh, Mr. T is sitting at home and he just shudders. Somebody trash talked my phrase. So now you know what he actually thinks of that uh, phrase. It's not quite what most people think it is. And you know, it's no telling whether he's like, oh no, I this phrase taken off, his mom says something. He's like, oh, okay, I'll change it. He's like, oh no, it's biblical pitying. Like everyone just kind of looking like, really? Biblical? He's like, yes, biblical. He's kind of like gives him the give him the look and like raise their fist. Like that's exactly what it means. Like, oh yeah, Mr. T, yeah, that's excellent. Yes. Yep. Back to Stallone. He knew he found his villain for Rocky Three and Mr. T, as Mr. T had the looks and the voice and even the boxing ability he needed, so the job went to him. There was one story uh, about right before Mr. T, they thought they had the absolute perfect boxer. He was just this massive mountain of a man and you know, had all the boxing skills and intimidation that he needed. Unfortunately, he had like an even more uh, effeminate voice than Mike Tyson, more of a lisp and whatnot. Apparently, it was like bad and the dude could not act. Like, you look perfect. He's like, hello, I would like to be a boxer for you. This is massive dude with like this cracky, warbly voice. And apparently it was a very shocking thing for them to say, to see. Hi, guys. Yeah, yeah, that's basically what it was. Hi, guys. I would like to be the boxer in this movie. 
I pity the fool. I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> yeah, but yep. Apparently, that's pretty much what the dude sounded like. Did not have that problem with Mr. T, however. Oh, God, no. Yeah, yep. Yeah, nope. Rocky Three was Mr. T's first acting role, and the credits even say, Introducing Mr. T. And with the help of some acting coaches and some good solid work, eth- solid work ethic, Mr. T killed his first acting gig, and that movie is what put him in the Hollywood spotlight for everyone to see. Until his dark secret is revealed. His name isn't really Mr. T. Well, I guess technically it is. Well, yeah, it is. Yeah, it 100% is. Yep. Right after Rocky III, he appeared in another boxing film called Penitentiary 2, performing in a role specifically written for him. And he also, at the same time, appeared on an episode of the Canadian sketch comedy series Bizarre, where he fights and eats a one Super Dave Osborne. Remember Super Dave, Dave? I do remember Super Dave. However, next was going to be Mr. T's most iconic role to date, and most iconic role of all time. Cut to L.A., 1983, and producer Stephen J. Cannell, hot off the Rockford Files and the greatest American hero, gets called into the office of the president of NBC. Do you remember Stephen J. Cannell and all his productions? He had the uh, little blurb at the end where he'd be on the typewriter and he'd throw the piece of paper and go like, do, 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 oh, and right, right, the piece of paper yeah. and make a big C. Yep. Yeah. If you ever saw that after or before a show, wherever it was, that was a Stephen J. Cannell production. Which, I uh, assume he, the C is for Cannell. No. Uh, <laughs> what's the C for? Uh, um, damn, I was gonna try to think of something clever, but nothing came to mind. <laughs> I say again, boo, <laughs> boo. <laughs> uh, have something on the spot. Uh, yep, I should have. I should have had something written down, but I did not predict your uh, your iron trap of a wit there, good sir. <laughs> So, Stephen J. Cannell gets called in the office of the president of NBC, and here's Stephen J. Cannell's personal recount of how the meeting went down. This is his words, and as close as he can remember it. President of NBC, Stephen, I have a show I want you to do. It's kind of like Mad Max, but it's not Mad Max. You remember the Dirty Dozen? Well, it's something kind of like that. And you know this guy, Mr. T, in the new Rocky movie that just came out? Well, he's going to drive the car. That was the idea Stephen J. Cannell was floated, and that half-baked and presumably cocaine-fueled idea became the A-Team. How is it Mad Max? I have no clue, dude. (laughs) Maybe the original plan was slightly better. Uh, I mean, he's referring to the fact there's a car wreck every episode. Okay, fine. You know, I guess. But (laughs) that's a stretch. Yeah, honestly, I have no idea, and I don't even think Stephen J. Cannell knew. Because remember, this was the president of NBC. <laughs> this doesn't mean he was good at his job. He, like, he actually lost his job meeting. shortly after this. Hmm? He doesn't even remember the meeting. <laughs> yeah, uh, probably not. But again, that that's what Steven said. His own words as he went in the meeting and he just got blabbed at that. And he was just like, oh, so I guess this is what we're doing. Uh, well, how much do you remember about the A-Team anyways? Um, like I said, I mean, there's a car wreck every episode. Yeah, there this was- is true. Hundreds of rounds spent and no one ever died. Which no, is, there's occasional explosions of people like leaping away from them, being like, Wah! I mean, after a while, they would, you'd think the bad guys would be like, They're not gonna kill me, I mean, they're gonna, they're gonna <laughs> right? Shoot. At some point, they could just like literally walk right up to one of the A team members and they'd just be shooting all around. They'd just be like, Pop, I shot you from six feet away. And I mean, look, I know it, I know it. this is America, and you know, it's fairly. Yeah, especially back in the 80s, getting a bunch of ammunition would be like, okay, sure, whatever. You know, like, do you want 12 boxes or 50? You know, it's fine. We'll but, load it up for you. Oh, all yeah. these other guns in your van. No well, question. that's America. No question. But you'd still think that's a lot of ammunition they always fired with random ass guns, like almost MacGyvering. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah and else- even out MacGyver, MacGyver. And also the thing, too, is they have all these guns and weapons, yet uh, they are on the run from the law, from the military, and uh, somehow they've still got all these, like, underground connections to buy everything they need and not get detected. That's what I'm saying. Like, they, look, I understand they were an elite group of soldiers from... Um, Vietnam. Vietnam. I don't know why I like that, but Vietnam. I don't remember v- the trained Vietnam, how to do, like, urban warfare, and not just urban warfare, but, like, spy shit. And for some reason, either every mission, like, oh, I've got a plan. And this, they bust out the stuff where it's like, who, who trained you in that and why? 
because I mean, were they CIA? I mean, if they're CIA, then that made more sense. But I don't believe they were CIA. They were just some like group in Vietnam. They got framed, and yeah, I do not believe they they're CIA either. I think they were just like uh, military special forces was the term that was used. Because yeah, you did have like who was it? Face Man, who uh, or. Which one was it that was constantly in disguises? He was like the master of disguise and would just show up and wear yeah, something like yeah, a rubber that guy. monkey suit. I, right. It's like, how often was that rubber monkey suit useful right. in the in the jungles of Vietnam? Right. Like, how how often are you like using your super secret spy well, tech to break into some kind of fucking fo- uh, hut in the middle of the jungle? I don't. Yeah. I would like to see once, one time you had to use that ability. Uh, it's just one of those like, hey, for this mission, we're going to need a gorilla costume like we had back in Nam. I'm going to go rent one. And next year, they're like, well, we need a driver's license and a deposit. So uh, people at the costume shop look at me like, hey, wait a minute. This is a person I saw in the news who is wanted for war crimes. <laughs> and not on top of that, too. They were so good at avoiding the government, yet any Ma and Pa who owned a uh, bodega could be like, hey, we know where to find the A-team and hire them. <laughs> right. My dog's missing. Let's call the A-team. Yeah, what? right. <laughs> And the government sure is couldn't find him. You'd think the government would just set up like a little, you know, uh, shop or something. Be like, help, help. We're in need of the A-team. And sure enough, they would come out. My nine-year-old grandma's having trouble with her social security. Let's call the (laughs) A-team. First of all, I know who the A-team is. And second of all, here's their number. I found it written on the bathroom wall. Ha, yeah. (laughs) And also, this is before cell phones, too. So, I mean, what do they do? Just hang out outside of a payphone with their van? (laughs) Right, it, exactly. It's the eighties. <laughs> Who did they call? What landline? Where? Where is their numbers being routed to? And then where are those numbers going? And how did they establish that? Just there's so many questions. So very Just many questions left unanswered. And also every episode too, they would, or at least almost every episode, it felt like they would uh, modify their van, just weld a bunch of stuff to, it and turn it into like a tank. And then next week it was all done. All the welding would fall off. And then you had the crazy guy who I guess was the pilot, but he was. Mad Murdoch, I think it was his yeah. name. How did I remember that? Um, uh, oh, yeah, that's another right. thing that bugged me about the A-Team, too. A lot of times they'd be, like, held up in a barn somewhere surrounded by the bad guys, and all of a sudden there just happened to be, like, a welder and a giant pile of scrap steel and, like, an old military cannon, <laughs> Civil War cannon for them to make. Or the, some comedian who's like, look, I made a bomb with this tape and a stick of dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to find later on. I made this bomb out of thin air. Oh, yeah. What did right. you use? Uh, thin air and a bomb. <laughs> I, I found it over here behind this uh, this manure. Yeah. Look at all this manure. I wonder what we'll do with this. Uh, all right. In their first meeting, Stephen J. Cannell asked Mr. T about his iconic gold chains. And Mr. T told him that all those gold chains by this point weighed 50 pounds and took him over an hour to take off or put back on. So he basically never took them off. He slept in them. He wore them all around and he showered in them. Mike, can you imagine how much that would stink? Like stink? Right. That was my thought, too, because uh, so many dead skin cells got to get in there and whatnot. I mean, surely you had to take it off from time to time. When that happened, just and also just you imagine the bruising. You know, that would be constantly hitting your chest, right? Even just like casually walking through the room. Yes, because <laughs> after reading this, I have like six necklaces or something like that, that I've collected over the years. I only wear a couple of them, but I took like all six of those, threw them on, and that was kind of heavy and uncomfortable. And that's like a whole whopping half ounce or so, you know. I, I mean, mean, I'll give you this. He's you know practicing like a saying, you know. So if he was working out with that stuff on. Yeah, do you, like to take on Vegeta next. Okay, let me take these off. And he picks them up. And he drops it. Like all the gold shatters the ground. Yep, so absolutely. Like, the gold now, is fine, but it just makes this giant dent into the yes. pavement. He's like, now I am like, at my full power. Right. You've yet to see him in my final form. Yep. And then after he takes it off, he immediately just flat foot jumps to the top of the nearest building. Don't worry, Mister T will take care of it. Whatever I gotta say, is. that would be a pretty good intimidation check, too. If all of a sudden you're in the middle of fighting a guy and barely when he's just like, hold up, pulls off 50 pounds of uh, necklaces, he's like, thunka. Or worse, he takes it off and then like wraps it on his fist like a fucking like, uh, <laughs> glove. Like, okay, now I'll push the shit out of you with this. I am power fist. <laughs> <laughs> so, an hour to take on and off jewelry was not going to work for a TV show when, you know, he's going to have to do costume changes and this and that. 
So they had the costume designers take a quick long look at his uh, necklace. Quick long look. Yeah. And they decided to recreate the look of the necklaces and just add a whole quick connect. So something that would take him an hour before now just took a matter of seconds. You just walk up, throw those necklaces on them, and just quick connect them on and off. Mr. T loved the newfound convenience and started wearing the fake jewelry all the time and take all his good stuff and just stuck it in the bank because he liked being able to like not have 50 pounds of weight around his neck at any moment. I can understand that. Yeah, totally. So on the A-team, Mr. T played one B.A. Baracus. Do you want to guess what B.A. stands for? Badass. Honestly, that was my first thought, too. But no, it is not. This is something more family-friendly. Take a couple uh, more guesses. I don't think you'll ever guess it. Jesus saves. Uh, B.A. is for Jesus saves? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like, I don't know what they say. That's, that's what they mean to me. <laughs> B.A. stands for Jesus saves. Mr. T, are, are you illiterate? That's not the point. <laughs> <laughs> Go fuck yourself, kid. I never learned how to read. <laughs> um... <laughs> Big ass. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know BA it. stands for Bosco Albert. Yep, that's right. Bosco Albert Baracus. So it was a, so it was a it was a random name. It wasn't like standing for anything. Nope. Yeah, I always <laughs> assumed it like stood for something like badass or you know, BA was just something or his rank or whatever, but nope. Ba- BA is Bosco Albert. What was his last name? I thought it was Barabbas with a B. Baracus with a C. Like mm. kind of like Baraka from uh Mortal, Mortal Kombat. Kombat. Yeah. So just think nowadays, Bosco Albert Baraka from Mortal Kombat. That would be funny if Baraka's real name was Bosco. Right. <laughs> I'm a demon from hell. My name is Bosco Albert. With swords in my arms for whatever reason. Yep. Mm, makes it a pain in the butt to wipe my ass. Well, they're retractable. Were they retractable? Oh, okay. I didn't yeah. remember that. I don't know how, how retractable they were in the game, but I know like in the other stuff they were. I was wondering, too, if you had, like, retractable blades like that, and if, you know, you're, like, not feeling good and you just sneeze really hard, do those blades come out kind of like a shart sort of thing or cough? You think so. Then, of course, that'd be really awkward sometimes. The show was an instantaneous hit, premiering at number one and staying there, taking NBC out of third place among the big three and putting them at number one. Because back then, all we had was ABC, NBC, and CBS. And we did have basic cable, but, you know, that was for rich people. Yeah, I remember people kind of say, like, cable wasn't much. I mean, they, they were specialty stuff, but as you said, it was just... And then back then, even satellite was totally different than it is now, because you just have that giant, huge satellite dish in your front yard, and you didn't really have a satellite package you just or a company. you just pick up whatever satellite you could out of the sky and be like, there it is. And you could just literally look in this book and be like, hey, here's where the Denver uh, new satellite is. Point it there, and you get Denver TV. Yay. And punch in the specs and everybody just watch the satellite dish be like, Rrrr. and then those things were in lawn ornaments for the longest time of our youth. Especially the big giant ones. Yeah, that's the ones I'm talking about. Those giant yeah, black yeah. ones that were just, yeah. you know, 20 feet across. But boy, howdy, those were fancy back in the day. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, oh, wow. Look what I got. Look what dad got the other day. He spent $50,000. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He works at this place called Microsoft that just opened up and made it big. The A-Team was an instantaneous hit, premiering at number one and staying there, taking NBC out of third place of the big three networks. The general public, especially kids, loved the show. However, watchdog groups hated the show, claiming it as a hyper-violent show that damages children. They even touted the number of up to 39 acts of violence in one hour, making it the most violent TV show ever, they said. But as we talked about earlier, what they don't mention, this is all cartoon violence. You know, they just stand there shooting at nothing in particular. Nobody gets hurt. Nobody gets shot. Nobody dies. Explosions happen. People just leap slowly out of the way, and they're fine two seconds later, and they run away being all scared. They'll empty the entire clip towards someone who's like 10 feet away, and they show go, oh, I'm scared. Yeah. <laughs> or they'll empty that entire clip like right at the ground at their feet, make them do the little dance before they run off, because, you know. Bullets right. aren't going like, to ricochet potentially off the dirt and hit them in the leg or anything like that. <laughs> Dance for me. Pew, pew, pew. Pow. Oh, God. It hit a rock. Oh, uh, yes. I remember the, the stories of the special forces that went to Vietnam and shot at their feet and scared them. <laughs> ha, with, with their gorilla costumes on. Yeah, with their gorilla costumes on. <laughs> that like, was big uh, psychological warfare of the uh, Vietnam War. It's just a bunch of soldiers running around in gorilla costumes shooting at the ground in front of people. We're both frightened and confused. 
Why are you here? Go away. Yeah. <laughs> we wanted none of this. Go uh, firebomb Cambodia some more. <laughs> firebomb like someone else. Maybe. Yeah, right. B.A. Barakas was supposed to be a side character in the show, but quickly become a fan favorite. And even soon, he was having whole episodes based around him. And the people loved him. His popularity kept growing as the show went on. However, one person who wasn't too big a fan of this was George Pappard, who played Hannibal on the show. You see, Pappard was a seasoned vet in the acting world, and he didn't like the fact that Mr. T wasn't an actor who paid his dues and only got on the show because of his looks and popularity. No altercations or anything happened on the set, just some grumbling and uh, some bitter interviews going back and forth. Wait, Hannibal was the, like, the he was the leader playing, of the right? group. Okay, yeah. Okay. I love when we were playing yeah. together. Yep, that was George Pappard, and he was actually, like, a pretty up-there actor, you know, did stuff on Broadway, Oscar-winning movies, this and that. So he was an actor's actor, some people would say. I mean, I guess. I mean, sure. Do you want some up-and-comer coming out of nowhere? But, you know, at the same time... That's how Hollywood just, is, baby. Yeah, I mean, that just happens sometimes. Some douchebag is in the right place at the right time, and then... Ta-da. I mean, again, I gripe about that stuff all the time. I sure wish I was in the right place at the right time. Right. But unfortunately, I haven't been. If George Pappard so. is alive today, he probably hates the YouTube crowd. Oh, my <laughs> he God. He became famous for nothing! So, I mean, plus, he, he also became famous at the time when it was, uh, you know, Mr. T couldn't. Yeah, and, you know, even in the 80s, it was, or hell, even the 90s, I was hearing about, like, um, family matters. They told Urkel, the guy played Urkel, you're never gonna win in a war because you're black, basically. Yep. And so this was the 80s. So, dude, let let him have it. <laughs> Give him yeah, right. Let him have this. I mean, he made it, man. Be happy for him. It's such if you're such a hoity toity actor, surely that you'll get more work after this. I'm sure Mr. T is gonna because he got hired for his looks and he's solidified with that role. You're probably gonna have a better time getting other roles that's not angry black man mm-hmm. right yeah because he had range and stuff mr t i mean love him or hate him he was kind of a one-trick pony he was just a tough i pity the fool dude yeah I mean, he rode that pony till it dropped and good yep. on him. You know, yeah I'm oh yeah i would totally do the same thing i would say don't have a cow man all day like yep. if i, if I, over if I got, again. If I got 50 dollars every time i said don't have a cow man i'd be like that's all i'd say yep i would just be walking around like the don't have a cow man on loop right just like, i didn't do it yep Pay me for it. I will say it as much as you want. Here's another fun fact about the show. Mr. T never said, I pity the fool on the show. That was strictly a uh, Rocky Three thing at that time. Hmm. Yep. Seems like that'd be something he would have said. And it wasn't trademarked at the time either. But, you know, maybe as a studio thing. Or maybe he's just like, no, I, my, uh, I have too much respect for the line. Huh, I will not that, say it. That line must remain pure in my mind. Until someone pays me enough. Yep. So being popular with the kids on the show, the Children's Hospital Network got in touch with Mr. T about charity, and he jumped at the chance to help the kids. He did, after all, love working with kids in the Chicago projects, and now that he had money and fame to really help out, he was all about helping out the kids. He was constantly taking kids on the set of the A-Team or visiting them, visiting them in the hospital, hanging out with them all day, just being a cool dude. Kind of like how John Cena does nowadays, you know? He doesn't just show up for a few seconds and be like, hey, what's up, and then takes off. He, you know, hangs out, talks with the kids, plays with them. All sorts of fun stuff. I mean, it's far better having him or John Cena there than somebody like, I don't know, Frank Sinatra showing up and be like, hey, kid, sorry about the cancer. Where's your mom, eh? I'm going to give her the old bada bing tonight. You know. The bada bing. The bada bing. Yeah. <laughs> As the poor kid's just dying. Be like, ah, what are you going to do to my mother? My mother, no. My mother, no. <laughs> That's just kind of how I picture that happening. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you, I said, you basically, your interaction with fucking... Uh, you know, that Frank Sinatra is going to be fucking hentai. <laughs> <It's> like, <Yeah. laughs> uh, he did all sorts of things with that hat and cigar. This has been the first half of the Oft Off Topic show on Mr. T. Stay tuned for our next episode where we discuss the most violent TV show of the 80s, two of Mr. T's co-workers who really didn't like him, and how the Umbrella Corporation's T-Virus may be responsible for his entire career. This is where the ending jingle goes. This is where the ending jingle goes. I don't know if we need one. I don't know if we'll get one. But if we do, then here is where it goes.